Thank you for joining me online. I hope that you had a very Merry Christmas. And if you're watching this, I'm just honored that you chose to make Blooming Grove a part of your Christmas celebration this season. Now, as most of you know, we have spent the entire month of December getting to know the colorful cast of characters surrounding the birth of Jesus. The story of Christmas is wrapped around people, a real life people, common people, uh, whose lives are marked by unexpected surprises, unusual signs, and unbelievable stories. And in the midst of them all, hovering above them all, is the writer and director of it all, God. We've seen how God chose Mary, a humble Hebrew girl, to be the mother of his own son. How he spoke to Joseph, a confused carpenter, encouraging him to take Mary as his wife. He sent the angels to announce the, the birth of the Savior, not only to Mary and Joseph, but also to a group of unassuming shepherds, keeping watch over their sheep in nearby fields. And even though Christmas has passed, we're now two days after Christmas, the story isn't quite finished. There's one more group of the cast members in the Nativity story that we've yet to see. The Magi, the wise men from the East. They may have arrived a little late, but they play an important and impactful role in the story of Christ's birth. You know, the Magi come cloaked in magic and mystery. We normally think of there being three of them, although the Bible never says that. Uh, there may have been, you know, a dozen or even more than that for all we know. And although it's often depicted this way in nativity scenes and stories, it's unlikely that the Magi actually arrived on the day of Christ's birth. Uh, in fact, many Christians celebrate the day of the Magi's visit on January 6th, which is 12 days after Christmas. And that's actually where the, the song, The Twelve Days of Christmas, comes from. Um, it's the time between the birth of Christ and the arrival of the Magi, which is sometimes referred to as Epiphany, or uh, other times as Three Kings Day. Regardless of when they arrived, however, these wise men have played an unforgettable role in the story of Christmas. Although I did hear someone suggest that Jesus would have been better off if it had been three wise women instead of wise men, uh, they would have asked for directions, arrived on time, uh, helped deliver the baby, cleaned the stable, uh, maybe brought a casserole with them, and, and practical gifts, you know, from, uh, from Babies R Us, like diapers and wipes and, and formula. But that would have been an entirely different story. The actual story of the Magi's visit is told in Matthew chapter 2. If you have a Bible and you'd like to follow along, go ahead and open up to Matthew 2. And as with Mary and Joseph and the rest of the cast of Christmas, I believe that we can find something of our own story in their story. The wise men's story begins with their pursuit, the Magi's pursuit. You know, holiday time is often highway time. You know, ever since the Magi packed their bags for Bethlehem, the birth of Jesus has caused people to hit the road. And interestingly, the, the Christmas trips that we take actually have a, a lot in common with theirs. And you know, we don't have a, a star leading the way, but we might need GPS to guide us. Uh, we don't sit at king's tables during our travels, but grandma's cooking might be a feast fit for one. And we don't ride on the backs of camels, but you know, six hours in a minivan with four kids might make some moms wish they had one. But while our travels usually involve visiting family and friends, the Magi's journey was all about Jesus. The Bible says in Matthew chapter 2, verses 1 and 2, When Jesus was born, 
some wise men from the east came to Jerusalem. They asked, Where is the baby who was born to be the king of the Jews? We saw his star in the east and have come to worship him. These wise men pursued a star shining in the night from as far away as Persia, uh, Arabia, or maybe India. Uh, their journey may have been weeks or even months long. And I don't know exactly how God got their attention, you know, how, how they learned about this newborn king. Maybe an angel visited them, like the angel that visited you know, Mary and Joseph and the shepherds, or, or maybe they, they read about it in the scrolls of the prophecies from the Old Testament. Or perhaps they just discerned it somehow from the stars. But somehow, some way, they learned about the birth of Jesus, and they dropped everything to go and find him to pursue that star in the east. Now, we don't know exactly what that star was. For centuries, astronomers have you know, looked to the historical record and searched for evidence of what could explain the star of Bethlehem. Scholars have been discussing potential causes since at least the 13th century. Perhaps it was a supernova, a comet, a solar flare, or an alignment of planets like we got to see this past week with Jupiter and Saturn aligning. Or perhaps it was a, a supernatural event that just defies scientific explanation. Whatever it was, the Magi followed the guiding light of that star across miles of barren desert until they finally reached Jerusalem, the capital city of Israel, which would be the most likely place to find the newborn king of the Jewish people. Instead, they found King Herod. And fortunately, after an evening with Herod, his, his wise men, his scribes, explained to the Magi that according to the prophet Micah, the Messiah, the king, would be born in the city of Bethlehem. So the Bible then says in Matthew 2, verses 9 and 10, And the star they had seen in the east guided them to Bethlehem. It went ahead of them and stopped over the place where the child was. And when they saw the star, they were filled with joy. Now Christmas is all about that pursuit the journey of faithful people trudging through the desert to find their Savior and King. And, and people today are still seeking Him, although they don't always know where to look. And for the wise men, the journey ended with the baby in the manger. But for us today, that's really where the journey begins. These magi didn't grow up in church. Uh, they, they may never have prayed with their parents at bedtime, at least not to the God of the Bible. Uh, they never went to Sunday school. They never memorized any verses from the New Testament. Uh, chances are they, they probably didn't even know Genesis from Job. But at some point, they, they literally saw the light, and they chose to pursue it. And when they did, they found Jesus. And God promises the same to each one of us. You know, the Bible says in Acts chapter 17, verse 27, God's purpose was for the nations to seek after him and perhaps feel their way toward him and find him, though he is not far from any one of us. God created us so that we would seek him and pursue him the same way that these magi did. But we don't have to travel nearly as far as they did if we'll simply reach out to him, feel our way toward him, we will find Jesus, just as they did. So the first scene in the Magi story is this pursuit. The second scene is the Magi's praise. The Magi's praise. This was the real purpose behind their pursuit. Remember, when, when the Magi arrived in Jerusalem, they asked King Herod in chapter 2, verse 2, Where is the newborn king of the Jews? We saw his star as it rose, and we have come to worship him. They came to worship 
Jesus. And when they finally found Jesus, that's exactly what they did. We read in verse 11, they entered the house and saw the child with his mother Mary, and they bowed down and worshipped him. This, this is what Christmas is really all about. They came to worship Jesus. I hope that's why you came too. I know that Christmas is a time for family and friends. It's a time for giving and receiving gifts. It's a time for trimming trees and decorating the house. You know, we sing carols and watch classic Christmas movies. But in the midst of all of that, let's never forget that Christmas is about the birth of Christ. It's a celebration of Jesus. It's a time to praise him, to glorify him, to focus on him and worship him for all that he is and has done and will do. This time of year, we, you know, we often praise Jesus in song. We sing Christmas carols about his birth at church. And, you know, we sing, sing along with the radio in the car. And, and we may even sing, you know, Christ's praises as we go caroling from door to door. In fact, I think most of us associate worship with music. You know, we, we think about singing. But I don't think that the Magi worshiped Jesus with song. You know, the Bible doesn't record that they sang any hymns. It doesn't record you know, any carols that they might have written. Instead, it, it simply says they bowed down and worshipped him. I don't know what their worship consisted of. You know, perhaps they sang a song or maybe, maybe just offered some words of praise. Or maybe their worship consisted primarily of a broken and contrite heart. You know, thoughts and feelings of reverence and awe. You know, depending on your, your church background, worship may conjure different images in your mind. You may think of church services with singing and, and praying and listening to a sermon. Or you may think of ceremonies and candles and communion. Worship can include those elements, but worship is far more than those simple expressions. Worship doesn't start and stop with a prayer or a song, and it, it can't be contained within a brick building for one hour on Sunday mornings. Worship is the expression of our hearts in response to all that Jesus is and says and does. It's a mixture of joy and reverence and awe evoked by the awareness of God's greatness, goodness, and grace. It's bowing before an uncontested, incomparable God of infinite might and glory and power and wonder who stepped down from his throne in heaven and into the arms of a teenage girl in the company of a carpenter on the floor of a stable. On the first Christmas, the Magi came to praise Jesus. Let's follow in their footsteps. Let's worship Jesus in spirit and in truth, not just on Christmas Day or even on Sunday, but every day from the bottom of our hearts. So the Magi's first scene is about their pursuit. The second scene is about their praise. And the final scene in the Magi's story is about their presence. The Magi's presence. Ask any kid, and they'll tell you the best part of Christmas is the presents. And, and as commercialized and greedy as that might sound, it's not entirely wrong. The tradition of giving gifts at Christmas time can be traced all the way back to the gifts given to the baby Jesus by these magi. After finding the house where Mary and Joseph were staying, the Bible says in verse 11, then they opened their treasure chests and offered him gifts of gold, frankincense, and myrrh. Now, gold we're pretty familiar with, and that, that's something that's still highly coveted today. But I doubt that frankincense and myrrh made a whole lot of Christmas wish lists this year. And it reminds me, actually, of three boys who were uh, in a Christmas play at their church, and they were playing the part of the three wise men, and they were to give their gifts to baby Jesus. So on the night of the play, the, the first little boy stepped up and he handed his gift and, and said, gold. 
And then the next little boy stepped forward and he held out his gift and said, Myrrh. And then the third little boy stepped up and held out his gift and said, Frank sent this. <laughs> That's a terrible joke. <laughs> but, uh, you know, actually each of these gifts was meaningful. Gold was the traditional gift for kings. Frankincense was an expensive type of incense used by priests and sages. And myrrh was an anointing oil often used to prepare someone for burial. Gold for the king of kings, frankincense for the great high priest, and myrrh because beyond the cradle awaited the cross. Ever since the Magi visited Jesus, Christmas time has been a time of giving. And did you, did you finish all your Christmas shopping on time? I hope you did. Uh, you don't want to be like the lady who waited till the last minute to, to send her Christmas cards. She rushed into the store and bought the very last pack of Christmas cards that was on the shelf. It had a nice cover design. So she took them home and she filled it out and said, Merry Christmas, and signed it and put them in envelopes and sent them out to 47 of her friends. But she never really stopped because she was in such a hurry to, to read what the card said on the entire, inside until things you know slowed down and on Christmas afternoon after everything had kind of settled down a little bit she she actually read what the card said and to her dismay the card read this card is just to say a little gift is on its way and suddenly she realized 47 of her friends were now expecting a Christmas present from her you know this year just like every year millions of people both Children and adults will open millions of gifts. Some won't fit. Some will be the wrong color. Many will be returned or exchanged. But there is one gift that meets everyone's need. One gift that will never wear out, never break, or never need repairing. You know, a gift that's appropriate for a small child or a teenager or an adult or a senior citizen, boy or girl, man or woman. It makes no difference. The presents the Magi brought, gold, incense and spices were wonderfully extravagant gifts but the gift we all need the most valuable gift of all is the baby lying in the manger christmas without christ is like a, a beautifully wrapped box that's empty inside as you give and receive gifts this christmas let it be a reminder that two thousand years ago on a silent and holy night in the little town of Bethlehem, Jesus gave us the greatest gift of all. He gave us himself. I think that these wise men understood the true meaning of Christmas, perhaps better than anyone else in the whole cast of Christmas. The Magi's pursuit reminds us that God longs for us to look for him, and he'll even light the way. The Magi's praise reminds us that Jesus is the reason for the season, and he is the only one worthy of worship. And the Magi's presence remind us not only that it is better to give than to receive, but that the greatest gift ever given, the one we all need, is Jesus. That's what Christmas is all about. But the story isn't over, because the story of the Nativity is really just the beginning of the greatest story ever told. And it's a story God has personally invited you to become a part of. As you recover from Christmas this week and, and excitedly march into a new year, please remember that God wants more than for you to simply hear the Christmas story or even share the Christmas story. He invites you to become a part of it, to become part of his cast of characters. And if there's any way that I can help you with that, please reach out to me and let me know. In the meantime, let's pray together. Lord God, thank you for Christmas. Thank you for the joy and peace and comfort that we can experience because of the birth of Jesus. Help us follow in the footsteps of these wise men who pursued Jesus across great distances who bowed down to worship him and presented him with costly gifts. Help us to pursue Jesus just as vigorously. 
to praise him just as vibrantly. And may we be willing to give him everything that we have and everything we are. We praise you and your son in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you once again for joining me. I hope you had a Merry Christmas, and I hope you have a wonderful new year. I'll see you next Sunday.